coming to the prophetic realm. Uh, what are we talking about the afterlife? You know, I think it's, I'd like to mention that when you die, you meet Jesus and the light of God and, and deceased loved ones, angels, and so forth. But I'll just remember this. The first person you meet will be yourself. And we, you're going to see who you really are. Who you really are. And so life on earth is this challenge to get back to who God made. Who we really are. Ourselves at our best. Ourselves at the height. Because that's what heaven is, is the peak of the best we've ever been. And we need to get to that level and maintain it through discipline, like I said. And through prayerfulness and through circumspection. Getting rid of the impatience of life. And also... Um, Remember that, speaking of, when we were speaking of spiritual warfare, that love reverses the curse. And Jesus said, bless your enemies. This gets rid of the attack of the evil one a lot of times. A lot of times it's difficult. There's no one formula. There's no one, every one situation is different. That's why we have the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, when people ask me difficult questions, as they often do ones I certainly can't answer, I, I say something, it sounds like a cop-out, but it's the honest answer. Ask the Holy Spirit. Because every life is unique. Everybody is unique. Every challenge is unique. There are certain things that help in all circumstances, but, but like I said, everybody has different situations. The Holy Spirit knows you better than you know yourself. He, God, created you. And uh, I would like to, and I have to just grab it here, indulge me. I, I also would like to do, before we move on, um, a prayer for pain and healing. You know, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, so much, so much is around us that we don't realize. So many hidden things. Even you take, even something like Hollywood. People, you know, that's, that means Hollywood, but it's not really Hollywood. It's, uh, it, it goes back to the Norse god, god Odin. It's a pagan thing. Celtic witches and druids and so forth, they had that, what we now call, it's actually a type of wood, holy wood. They used it to, to um, wizards use it for their wands. And now we have Hollywood, and just south of Hollywood, we've got the magic wand down there at Disney. So we see all these, quote, coincidences. And uh, knowing that they're not coincidences at all. Um, lastly, just a few more points on this morning's discussions. I said, if you remember nothing else, remember how important love is. But also remember this. Trying in prayer to view life, your life, every day, as if you're on the other side, as if you're watching yourself in your life review, as if you're going to and, and, and conduct yourself and speak, just as if you're going to see it again, because you are going to see it again and experience it again. If you view life and do things in life as if it's your last day on earth, Everything is at your last minute. You are on the way to direct entry into heaven. Conducting ourselves in that fashion. Remembering that what in life 
remembering to get rid of what in life draws darkness, draws darkness. And when things don't work out for us, so like I said, if they're intractable problems, we may need to fast, we need to cast something out or things out. And or, or it's just not in God's timing. Wait for God's timing. Don't force things. And we also don't accept the evil report. What I mean, like somebody, doctor comes in the room and says, you have cancer, you have six months to live. That's an evil report. He doesn't know. He's not God. So many people we hear from. I wrote a book recently. I don't know if we, I think we had some that. No, we didn't have it here. We have it online. I wrote a book called The God of Healing. Little booklet. Again, it's on the website, spiritdaily.com. And that prayer I recited, that prayer, that exorcism prayer, deliverance prayer, I'm not an exorcist, only a priest is, with the permission of the bishop. But it's a deliverance prayer that was recommended for anyone to say by the exorcist in Rome, the chief exorcist. That whole prayer is in the back of a book called Life, Mission, Family, Healing, a little book that I put together on healing the family tree. Again, available on spiritdaily.com since we're out of them here. But don't force things. Don't accept the evil report. You know, a lot of people, when they, not a lot, but a number of people who've had the afterlife experience, they say that when they were outside the body, they were watching the doctor, the surgeons operate on them. They were in surgery. And they say they were amazed because behind the surgeon, was an angel with his hands and his arms and hands through the doctors, really the angel conducting a lot of the delicate surgery. That's why a lot of surgeries go very well after we pray enough, don't they? And then of course the doctor comes out and he, he figures his, it's all his work. If only, and there are some great Christian doctors, prayerful doctors, but if only they all prayed, if only they gave more credit to God, if only they invoked angels more, oh, how much better off we'd be. And, and, and if we prayed about what we should eat and how we should conduct our life. Don't force things, but living in the Holy Spirit. And on the matter of spiritual warfare, lastly, before we delve into uh, some other items here. A lot of evil entered Canada, entered the United States, entered the world, the West, in the 1960s. It's a very mysterious decade. 1966 was the foundation in San Francisco of the Church of Satan in the West, Eastern America. And in uh, 1969, was the first Satanic Bible published. Very peculiar time. You saw all this rock music coming in with a beat that some people say is similar to a voodoo beat. Matter of fact, when they play it over in Africa, the natives get upset, saying you're drawing spirits. Some of, the, some of the music we had in the 60s, and of course now it's in a lot of ways even worse. It's not always just the lyrics, although those lyrics were a problem a lot of times and very clever and underhanded, but it, it's the beat, it's the music, it's the opening the soul, and it's opening the soul to drug use. Drug use is pharmakia. It's a pharmakia was used for centuries by witches. Drugs bring in evil spirits. So you had that in the 60s, all the drug use, you had this beat going on there, you had the spirit of rebellion, and it tells us in scripture that the spirit of rebellion, of rebellion is as the spirit of witchcraft. So you had that come in during the 1960s, free sex, all of a sudden, you had what the pagans used to call Saturnalia, orgies and free sex, and no longer was it just monogamy. It was 
anything goes, and pretty soon it becomes going out into accepting sodomy, homosexuality, which used to be against uh, the law, and fornication, out, uh, fornication, sex outside of marriage. We forget that heterosexual sin is also sin. It's not just homosexuals, gays, and there's any, any sin is a sin. And we had all the Saturnalia going on, and then that led to, of course, using contraception, which for contraception led to a lot of that, too. It was a vicious circle because it allowed a lot of the free sex. And this all culminated just after the 1960s, of course, in 1973 in the United States with the Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion, which is kind of like a blood sacrifice. So you had rituals leading up to a blood sacrifice. And then we wonder why the world, the West, Canada, United States, which of course has not only abortion, but is moving sometimes dangerously in the direction of euthanasia up here. We had, we wonder where the evil came from that we now contend with, the darkness, the dark, the dark cloud. I, uh, I'll get more into that dark cloud in a second. But I would, before I do, I'm switching a little bit. I was going to mention this in the last set, session, but I feel like doing it now. Just uh, quickly, because I, I'm no historian and I'm not going to lay a lot of history on you. But a couple points I want to make about North America. Sure, there were as we all know, Native Americans for many, 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 many centuries. As far as the European uh, foundation of this, of North America, Canada and the United States. Christian, and specifically, if I mean, you'll indulge me, those who are not Catholic, I have to say as a Catholic, it was founded as a Catholic territory. A, a couple of points on that. Some people think the first mass ever said in the Americas, in this hemisphere, was in the 6th century, maybe even like in the 520s, by St. Brendan, coming over from, from uh, you know, from Scandinavia. But that, they can't really document that for sure. They say it was on St. Uh, Brendan's Island, uh, maybe Newfoundland, but no one's... Uh, no one's uh, sure of that. Um, excuse me, I'm, I'm, mixing, I'm, I'm mixing one thing up there. Because it was also in the 12th century. Um, I, think it, I, th I think that that uh, was La, La Anse du Meadows. And I'll straighten this out here in a second. But uh, the point being that there were possibly Norsemen with early mass here in Canada, in North America. We know for certain that we know for certain that there was uh, there was a mass right there where I live in Florida, in St. Augustine. It's the first documented mass in 1565. And I'd like to uh, I'd like to hover on that for just a second. Let me just first of all, I just want to make sure that yes, it was Saint Brendan. That was correct. And then around 1112 would have been like I said, Laans. No one's really certain about these things because they're so long ago in the past. But of course, you know, we know here in, in Canada that. The Shrine of St. Anne, which came, I think, in the 1660s, was started. And where a miracle occurred, by the way, with one of the construction workers, this is foundation of Catholicism and Christianity. You're going to see how it ties into prophecy in a moment. I mentioned this morning that the first Catholic who recorded near-death experiences was Gregory the Great. 
Pope Gregory the Great, Saint Gregory the Great, Doctor of the Church. There's also Gregory the Great, who during the sixth century, during his pontificate, he looked around and at the time Rome was being absolutely ravaged. There were constant invasions by barbarians, you know, uh, back then. There were, there was a tremendous plague, bubonic plague going on at the time. Not the famous one later on, but a very serious one. All of these things were going on. And as he said, it was so bad that the plague even claimed the life of Pope Pelagius II. Am I like be mispronouncing that. There was it's a rampant fever was going around. And it caused him, it caused Pope Gregory, who took over after that, it caused uh, him to wonder if it was the final judgment. That's how bad it was in Rome. Rome was being decimated because of what it had done, of course, because of all of its orgies, because of its materialism, because of its, its gluttony, because of all those things with all those emperors and, and the rank and file also. In a letter to King Ethelbert of Kent, Pope Gregory speculated, this is a direct quote from Doctor of the Church, that Quote, the unending kingdom of the saints is approaching, and he predicted that there would be many unusual signs, including, quote, changes in climate, tears from heaven, unseasonable tempests, wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. As he wrote, everywhere death, everywhere mourning in Rome, everywhere desolation, He said, cities are destroyed, armed camps overturned, districts empty to peoples, the earth reduced to solitude, not a native remains in the countryside, nor scarcely an inhabitant in the cities. Nevertheless, these small remains of humankind are still being slaughtered daily and without cease. The scourges of heavenly justice have no end because even in their midst there is no correction of the faults of our actions. Six hundred. Rome being destroyed by what a great pope said was a punishment for its evil. Evil that a lot of people are comparing to our own time. More on that in a minute, but you know, here's where it gets interesting. So Gregory the Great sees all this dying from plague and invasion and everything else. Poverty, probably economic collapse. And he had a statue of the Blessed Mother the Dark Madonna, that was wood carved. The legend was, the rumor was, the whatever you want to call it, the history was, that this had been carved by the Apostle Luke himself. And he considered it a, a palladium where, you know, that it, it would be powerful against evil. So he decided to possess it, to take it all around Rome with a uh, little parade of prayer warriors from the Vatican all through the streets of this ravaged city. When he, were, when he returned to the Vatican via Council of his own in the, the year St. Peter's, again, excuse my pronunciation, but they looked up at an old round rotund funerary. And there at the top they saw an angel who they thought believe was the Archangel Michael putting back into his sheath a sword, the sword of punishment, a sword of judgment. And the plague ended soon afterwards. The invasions ended soon afterwards. The chastisement, the great chastisement of the Roman Empire ended soon afterwards. Because, you know, it wasn't just in Rome. There were, there were there's a lot of people who think that there was a global event going on, that there were tremendous hurricanes at that time here in North America, that there was that change in climate, that um, there were unseasonable weather throughout Europe, that there were hail, hailstorms and floods, maybe even asteroid strikes that flooded cities. More on asteroids than on 
in this area. So he takes that around. And then afterwards, he gave that to the Bishop of Seville, Spain, who became Saint Leander, because the Bishop of Seville was undergoing persecution by Muslims who were invading Spain, taking over Spain, and as they invaded Spain, they were destroying all of the Catholic statues and crucifixes and persecuting Christians without mercy, destroying the Christian roots of Spain. And Bishop Seville believed that that stopped that invasion. Uh, but later on came another one. And they had to bury that, uh, they had to bury that, all of the statues that they wanted to preserve them. So they buried that statue under a church bell in a part of Spain called Estremadura. And specifically, an area called Hidden Channel, also known in the dialect. You say Hidden Channel is said Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. This is in the 1320s. 20, this is two centuries before Guadalupe, Mexico City. Well, interestingly, later on, there was an apparition. And, in the, excuse me, I jumped ahead. It was in the 1320s that there was an apparition to a shepherd. All the shepherds, huh? Look at Fatima and so forth. This shepherd named Gil Cordero. He had lost a cow, and he, he sees a little mound of earth, and on top of it is his dead cow. The, the animal had been killed somehow. So he went up to it, and through disease or whatever, it was laying there motionless, and he, he went to make the sign of the cross on it, which they did before they before they took the hide off that animal. And as he did it, it, it came to life and stood up. And all of a sudden, at the same time, there was the Blessed Mother, an apparition. She told him to dig, have, have a bishop and a bishop dig where she was standing and build a shrine. He went back, he told the bishop, the bishop led a procession and they dug and they found this statue that had been given by Pope Gregory the Great. And they built a shrine and through the years it became a bigger shrine. And in the 15th century, one of the the, the people who used to come there included the king and queen of, of Spain. Isabel and Ferdinand, they, they went to the shrine. It was at this shrine that they prayed about whether to send boats over to try to discover a new land. It was at this shrine that a guy named Christopher Columbus worshipped. He went all the time. He had a great devotion to the Blessed Mother, especially the Blessed Mother of Guadalupe, Spain. He carried a replica of her on the Santa Maria boat to, when he crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Every, you know, when he was crossing, Christopher Columbus, I didn't know this, but Christopher Columbus I have this in that book, where the, the book I just came out with is called Where the Cross Stands. It's about all this, as well as prophecy brings you right up to the moment. Christopher Columbus was a third order Franciscan. He came very close to entering the seminary to become a priest. This wasn't just a Catholic. This was a devout Catholic. And he set forward, you can check me on this, he set forth looking for the new world, the rumored new world, to conquer it for Christ in the, and with the Blessed Mother's explicit help. She was even painted on the, on the backs of those early Spanish ships, those exploring ships. 
Christopher Columbus, every, every night on board the ship, they prayed, they prayed every day the Hail Mary. Whenever they landed somewhere, they saw Mary Regina. Soon after he discovered what became America, soon after that, you had the Blessed Mother uh, involved in other, other missions too. Ponce de Leon in Florida, very devout Catholic. DeSoto in Florida. They called everything at that time that was in the New World La Florida, which meant Paschal flowers, Easter flowers, because it was around Easter time that they think Ponce de Leon first came by in the 1520s. Florida. We and many of these, all of these early Spanish explorations had priests aboard. And not just one, sometimes up to 30 priests coming with in the fleet for the New World because they had the same mission, they pronounced the same mission that Columbus did. They were coming as devout Catholics to establish a Catholic territory. In fact, in some of their proclamations, one of them, I think it was DeSoto, actually proclaimed it when he landed in the west coast of Florida, proclaimed it for the Pope. Hidden history, forgotten history, ignored history, erased history. But none, nonetheless true. You know, finally, a very, again, very Catholic, a very Catholic uh, admiral named uh, Menendez, Pedro Menendez. He came across, and again, he had he had a, a good number of priests with him. And when he, um, one of the priests was a Father Lopez. They hit storms, they had problems, they lost ships and everything else, but they kept praying for the Blessed Mother to help. And it was on um, August, 27th, on August 27th of 1565, they were shown what Father Lopez believed to be a sign that they were about to spot the new world, because they were lost. And like he says, and I'm going to just describe it as he did, it came that evening when a comet suddenly blazed through the dark directly above the ship. According to Father Lopez, all were astounded for it gave, quote, so much light that it, must, that it must have been taken for the sun. It went toward the west, that is, towards Florida, and its brightness lasted long enough to repeat two credos. God, he wrote, quote, showed to us a miracle from heaven. Anyway, Next day, they spotted the land. It was Florida. Feast day of St. Augustine. At the, it, at the area we now know as the city of St. Augustine, oldest city in North America, oldest continuously settled city in North America. Because it's never stopped existing. And Menendez, Admiral Menendez, waited for his own landing. When Father, um, when Father Lopez went ashore on St. on the feast it was the feast day of St. Augustine. He put a